Um, I'm Mike Stevenson. I am um, quite active in the community, so I help Saravana run the Integration Monday kind of thing, if you've seen any of us with these T-shirts on. So we do integration webcasts on Microsoft technology every Monday night. And as well as that, I'm also a freelance integration architect, so I go around working with different companies and kind of figuring out how we're going to deliver integration solutions and how we're going to design and architect them. What we wanted to talk about in this session was a um, quick agenda is we've got this thing called Vision 2025, which Oliver's going to explain in a moment to you guys, but that's all about what the university is going to look like in the future. On the back of that, I'm going to talk about the things that have been changing and the things that makes it difficult for us to understand you know, what to build, how to design stuff, what technologies to use. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, this thing called the, uh, the Agile Integration Platform, which is our ideas about how we're going to deliver integration. And then... Rather than just you know, throw some ideas out there and, and keep it really um, sort of conceptual, I'm going to show you a demo that um, uses pretty much all of the stuff that we've, we're going to talk about, um, but also I'm going to try and make it a little bit fun as well. But then at the same time, I don't think it's fair to say that we're going to solve every integration problem, so I want to also talk about some of the challenges that I think customers have and, and just some, share some thoughts on that for you guys and then, and then open it up for some feedback from everybody to see what you guys think. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Oliver now to talk a little bit about Vision 2025. Um, right, okay. Um, firstly, uh, I want to tell you a bit about the university. Um, we're based in the northeast of England, um, in Newcastle, and we were originally founded in uh, 1969 as Newcastle Polytechnic. Um, we were awarded university status in 1992, and by the year 2000, we'd become the largest university in the northeast of England. Today we've got over 35,000 students and 3,000 staff in campuses across London, Newcastle and overseas. Uh, we're part of the UK higher education sector along with over 100 other universities um, and today we're all facing a little bit of a challenge. Um, traditionally the funding model of higher education um, has meant that it wasn't really a fully commercially competitive sector. There were uh, central controls imposed to restrict growth. So in, uh, in 1993, the Higher Education Funding Council of England um, implemented their maximum allowable student number, which was a hard cap on the number of students an institution could recruit. Um, in 2002, they did permit a 5% tolerance to the maximum, but if you really wanted to expand your business, you had to go through a central bidding exercise to secure permission and additional funds. And this system was strictly enforced, and universities got fined if they over-recruited. Um, and for the most part, that system is still in place today. There were some minor changes in 2012, um, which meant that the highest performing students at A-level who got two A's and a B or better were removed from the cap, so universities could recruit as many of those students as they liked. Um, and a year later, that was lowered to students getting an A and two B's, but really, that still only accounts for about 25% of the total student population. <coughs> this year, though, from 2015 onwards, the entire student cap system is being abolished in its entirety, which means for the first time, universities will be able to recruit as many students of whichever grades as they like. Now, naturally, this is going to mean different things for different institutions. Each one will have to think more carefully about its unique selling point, its competitive edge, and think about its recruitment strategy a bit more closely. Some, some places might decide to recruit large numbers of students, which might mean a focus towards shifting towards subjects that are easier to teach in large numbers. Others might want to focus on quality rather than quantity. Um, but either way, the removal of the student number cap is a highly significant moment in the history of UK higher education because it means genuinely free competition. And when we add to this the focus on tuition fees that will naturally be a part of the general election in a few weeks' time, I think it's safe to say the entire landscape of our sector is undergoing some fundamental changes. <coughs> And these are changes which Northumbria will adapt to on its journey towards Vision 2025. So, this is our vision for what kind of university we want to be in the year 2025. We want to continue to combine academic excellence with a real-world focus. So we want our students to continue to be recognised for their employability as well as their intellectual expertise. As part of that, it's really important that we continue our strong partnership work working with industry and it's important that we continue to produce internationally renowned research. But we also need to produce a high-quality teaching and learning environment to tie the whole thing together. 
So whilst it's fair to say we've got a wide range of objectives, they are all underpinned by the idea of demand focus. We have to respond to our environment. We have to be acutely aware of the world in which we operate. And we have to use our resources effectively to make the right decisions for our students. We want our students to see what they see every day when they use their Xbox or their iPhone or Facebook, a unified ecosystem of applications, platforms, and rich user experiences. We don't want them to see a fragmented, disparate collection of outdated processes which they experience through obtuse, inconsistent UX and UI. We want to have the right line of business systems effectively linked together, providing cohesive, illuminating MI that can help guide our decision making. And we know that none of that will be possible without a fundamental review of our, of our approach to integration. I think in, uh, in some places, there may in the past have been a tendency towards what I would say is uh, an anti-integration pattern, which was uh, to find the line of business system with the largest critical mass uh, and just buy more modules for it. I think the idea being that if you have a small line of business system dedicated to a particular task, then the vendor releases a new CRM module, you should take it. And then when your organization decides that it wants to introduce cashless payments, you should take the vendor's new identity card module and then their electronic point of sale module, at which point you've essentially created a stock management and inventory system. So you might as well use it to manage the rest of your inventory and the maintenance of that inventory. And by the way, did you know there's a really cool new financials module as well? You're collecting all this additional functionality in bolt-on module fashion, and before you know it, your small standalone line of business system has become the company management system. <coughs> it's been developed by the business, but it's never really been designed by the business. It's just grown. It's, uh, it's grown arms and legs and a few extra heads, and now it's too big to move because it's gorged itself on all the company's data. And I think there's probably some people who've maybe experienced a company management system that's just too big to get rid of. I think these applications were good solutions to the problems we used to encounter, and they may well be an adequate solution for the problems we have now. But we know, deep down, in their current state, they're not going to solve the problems of the future. Why buy a large application and spend most of your time switching off the things it does that you don't need? Why fight with brittle, inflexible applications where every part of it is tightly coupled to every other part? Why settle for buying 80% of what you want when you can build 100%? It's certainly true for us, and I expect it will be true for most other people, that with their existing legacy systems, there is an understandable pressure to sweat the asset, to get the maximum return on what will have been a sizable investment. There is an understandable fear of losing essential data and knowledge about how the company operates if you replace it. There is an understandable expectation to minimize the training burden if we do something new. But I don't think these challenges are insurmountable. Organizations just need the right level of technical and business governance to ensure these concerns are addressed without becoming a threat to innovation. So what Michael and I want to talk to you about today is why we feel that Northumbria's focus on integration is so important and how we're designing and implementing approach that'll get us away from siloed areas of the business. We'll still be using terms like sweat the asset, but I think we might use a slightly different definition of what an asset is. The data that we hold should be a key strategic asset, as valuable as our buildings, from which we can derive real business value and insightful MI. And this data will reside across multiple business systems, and our processes will span multiple areas. So it is our challenge, if we really want to leverage this asset, it is our challenge to rethink how we do integration. Integration shouldn't be something that we have to do, it should be something that we want to do. If we get this right, we want to be able to sit down with the business and ask them, what if? What if our art students of the future expect to be able to create 3D models in Microsoft HoloLens, collaborating with each other, and then submit their creations to their lecturer as coursework assignment, using a student teacher lookup in our student record system? What if we wanted to host a Newcastle versus Northumbria indoor rowing machine race in the cloud by sending data from both sets of rowing machines to real-time analytics in Azure? <laughs> what if we wanted the energy efficiency ratings of our buildings to be calculated and displayed in real time? What if the data we collect could provide us with a new KPI rather than just being used to enforce existing ones? We don't really know what customers will expect as a standard by 2025, or what the technology landscape will really look like. But one thing we do know is that we don't want to have to redo everything when something new comes along, if we can help it. 
So a while ago, we sat down and we analysed the uh, in IT. We analysed the kind of business projects we were being asked to deliver, um, and we found that certain key requirements came up time and again: application integration, master data management, approvals, workflow, notifications, business efficiency, management information. The similar similarity between these projects was quite startling. Whatever the business entity is, whatever this thing is, I want to send it on an approvals workflow. I want to generate notifications about it. I want to manage the master data I have about it. And at the end of the month, I want to count how many of them have turned from red to blue. And it doesn't matter if this thing is a purchase order, a holiday request, or even a piece of academic research. I still want to carry out the same fundamental business operations on it every time. And in order to do this, we found that each project was effectively building its own mini technology platform every time just to deliver the objectives. And where's the reusability? How many times do we see a business project utilize fundamentally the wrong tools and technologies because it's easier than using the right tools for the job and just integrating them? Perhaps the right solution for the business isn't a new line of business system at all. It's a new workflow, or a new data set, or a new data capture method, or just some process governance. And if the tools already exist to provide these things and we just need to tie them together, won't that be easier than implementing yet another monolithic application to do the job? Won't it be easier when we change our mind later on to just rip out the bit that we don't like and swap it for something else? One of the cornerstone messages of our IT strategy is this. When the business wants to solve a problem, we never want to be the blocker. Technology should never be the blocker, it should be the enabler. Whatever they can dream up, we want to be able to help show them why it's a great idea or sometimes why it's not so great an idea. But we never want to say that what they're trying to achieve is too complicated for us to build. So integration between line of business systems shouldn't be a big deal. It shouldn't be complicated, it shouldn't be onerous, and it certainly shouldn't be impossible. And we've recognized that in Northumbria, that integration should be a key component of our technical architecture so that we can focus on creating robust, scalable solutions that are a joy to use and a breeze to maintain. So I'm very excited that we're able to work with Michael to make all this stuff happen. Um, and he's about to bring it all, for life, all to life for us better than I ever could. So thank you very much. So you can see um, from that, you know, when I was chatting to the university, it's uh, around the time of Integrate. That's, that's the kind of company that I've been looking for in terms of an IT strategy of how to really do some properly cool stuff with, um, with integration. I mean, who, you know, you listen to that, who now, who doesn't want a job on my team now, you know? <laughs> um, I'm so used to working with companies where it's like integration's this thing we hate doing, it costs too much money, how can we do it cheaper? I've found a company who's said, I think if we do integration well, we can enable the business to do some really cool stuff, and, and that's you know that's where I think we're we're a little bit different from the norm, hopefully. So, with that in mind, and Oliver, um, who I thought you know as as a, all the customers I've ever seen speak at an event, I thought that was one of the most kind of inspiring kind of um, speeches there about what we're trying to do. So, my challenge is how do I live up to that um, in terms of design and building and architecting something that doesn't doesn't spoil his dreams and hopefully doesn't give him nightmares. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about the, this challenge that everything's changed and people are confused and, you know, how do we demystify some of this a little bit? So I just want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and one of the things that um, I've felt for a while is this idea of architecture silver bullets. So over the last number of years, we've, we've had all these commentators in the industry, and I, th I think you can kind of see that okay, you know, talking about different architecture paradigms. So, you know, we, we went through um, this idea that, you know, EAI was great, and then ESBs came along, and everybody said ESB solves all my problems. But then it, it introduced some new problems, and somebody came up with SOA, and suddenly ESB wasn't flavor of the month anymore, and, and everyone wants to do an SOA now. And, you know, product vendors realized that that could be monetized, and suddenly, the, you know, the whole um, ecosystem goes crazy about the SOA, but then people found there was problems with that, so the API economy emerged from that, and suddenly, you know, we just go around this cycle of these new architecture paradigms coming up with a couple of the newer ones, or, um, you know, microservices was the one we were talking about at Integrate, um, and I think for your first mention of microservices, and I, to, to make you happy, I've got a couple of slides about that in a minute. Um, but, you know, we've all seen this in, in 
um, various sort of publications we read from industry commentators, and, and it's been going on for a long time, but when I was trying to explain you know, the integration landscape to the guys, I was saying, well, look, if you think back, you know, I've, I've just made up these dates of roughly off the top of my head when I think they apply, so I may have got some wrong, but if you think back 20 years ago, we were doing things like ETL and batch integration, mainframes, you know, EAI, EDI was around, um, eventually XML came along, SOAP, REST, you know, some of the newer stuff, API economy, lightweight integration, and, and today we've got these, you know, Internet of Things, wearables, um, you know, microservices, no ESB being the, the new one people are starting to talk about. So the thing that is really important about this is actually that old stuff's still here. It hasn't gone away. We've just got a whole load of new stuff to think about. That stuff we might not do as much as we did at one time, but we still do it. But I've got a whole load of new stuff to think about. And when we build an integration platform, we need to be able to deal with all of these different types of things. But also we've got new, new um, sort of angles on this. So we've got things like scale to think about, where we might have to do you know, things like um, Internet of Things and wearables might be at a scale we've never had to think about before. And, and that means, as an integration architect, there's so many different architecture things I've got to think about, which is why it's challenging now. And then I started thinking about technology. So if, if any of you guys follow my blog, you'll have seen these slides come out a while back. And, and the idea here was, well, not only is architecture changing, but the technologies I would use in my toolkit have changed over the years as well. So if I thought back to 2009, what were the main tools that I was using to solve problems for customers? So the majority of the time I was using BizTalk. I was probably using some kind of web services, whether it was WCF or ASMX and SQL Server integration stuff. And, and most of the projects I worked on probably used those things. And it's quite a small toolkit there, you know? And we had some framework type stuff like XML and XSD and stuff like that. And we had that and it was fairly stable for a while, but then around 2013 when Azure kind of really started to take off, the, the landscape for technology changed a bit. So suddenly we had these extra things on premise. So we had things like workflow manager, service bus on premise. Um, we still had things like BizTalk. We've got this new stuff in the cloud. So we had web roles, worker roles. We could put VMs up there with things like BizTalk and other stuff on. And also we had um, bridging technology, so we had VPNs, we had service bus relays and queues and stuff like that. And that, that landscape grew you know, pretty big pretty quick. But then I think it gets me even more interesting where we think even just a year later, you know, if you think about that, that estate now, on-prem it's still kind of very similar, but the cloud side's just, just grown really rapidly. So we've got a whole load of new stuff in there like API management, caches, stream analytics, event hubs, you know. And the, these are all things that, when I thought back, these are things I've either been asked about as an integration architect, things I've had to research to use, or things I've had to research because I'm expecting to use them or be asked about them. And if you think of it as a toolkit, the number of technologies I need to be aware of is much bigger than it was. And then we've just hit 2015, and suddenly there's a bit more. You know, we've got app service, mobile apps, um, Logic apps, and, and, if, and, if you, and if even just for Dan's benefit, to make Dan happy, I've put task framework up there as well. So you made the framework list, mate. Um, and you know, we, we had a bit of a chat about this at the university. You know, and, and the thing is here, although we've got a lot of technologies, your, your initial thoughts like, whoa, that's a lot of stuff. But actually, it's not really that bad a thing because other vendors who do integration technologies for a long time have always had this huge list of products. You know, if you go on to people like IBM and um, Oracle, you'd, you'd find like, I think it was 40, 50 products that were on the IBM website that have an integration slant to it. And kind of we're in a similar space now where we've gone more modular, but also these technologies are, are more, you know, very much more focused. But the thing that I really like about the Microsoft stack is that, you know, when the guys at the university, you know, they did their whoa moment, I'm like, well, hang on a minute, because these are all just specializations of a .NET developer. So we can take a .NET developer, we can cross-train them into these different technologies. And, and as an organization, if I pick the right ones for me, then I can, I can specialize in the right way. So it's not as if I've got a completely different team for everything. It, the learning curve from one technology to another potentially isn't as big as it could be for other vendors. So I think that's quite an important point to note there. But I'll elaborate a bit more on that as we go through, as we go through the deck. Now, at this point, so we've, we've covered how things have changed and how for an integration group, whether it be you know, a team of developers, architects, or whatever, things have got more complicated. But 
at the university, we've got this agile integration platform we want to build. So I'm going to explain it at a couple of levels. So we're going to start at the, um, the conceptual level, and then we'll drill down a little bit and think about logical stuff. And then we'll go at the physical level at the end before I do the demo. And um, conceptually, the first thing to think about is what is it that would make us successful at integration? So this really feeds from the things Oliver was telling me. And to me, um, the most important one on here for, for us at the university is it's all about apps. You know, nobody cares about integration really bar, bar us who care about under the hood, but the, the student community and the staff community, they want awesome apps that makes their life really easy, make, you know, gives them good quality data when they need it, lets them do their job. So we need our developers to be able to build really awesome applications. We can empower them to do that by having a really good integration platform that makes their life easier. So that's one of our biggest areas. That's really on the back of integration as an enabler. But for me, um, as, a, as the delivery of this platform, the idea of an agile platform and just-in-time integration are really important too. So with the agility angle, um, what I want from a platform is, is the idea that um, if I need to change part of my architecture because we've got a new technology that does it better, you know, that's changing all the time, or the idea that some new architecture paradigm comes up or we get a completely new type of integration we need to do. If I want to make some changes to this platform, I want to make sure that the ripple effect of those changes doesn't affect everything. I want to be able to isolate these things. And this comes back to some of our core development principles about things like encapsulation and abstraction. But the ability to del deliver these in a, in a kind of way that really empowers us, so we're not, we're not um, taking months to deliver new stuff, we can do quick, uh, quick changes. So on the back of what will make us successful, we've really got two angles to this. So one of them is all about methodology and approach to how we do requirements, how we manage stuff. And I'm going to talk about this sometime in the future, potentially. But today, what I really want to focus on is the architecture angle. So it's all about technologies. It's about principles, patterns, blueprints, stuff like that. And that's what I think you guys will be most interested in. Before I talked about these, these commentators throwing the idea that all these architecture paradigms compete with each other, one's better than the other. But actually, I don't believe that's the case. I think sometimes there is overlaps to them, but a lot of the times they can be very complementary to each other if you use the right thing in the right place. So if we think about our con <coughs> uh, conceptual platform, at the heart of that, we've got the idea of ESB, AI, and some kind of services slash API architectures going on. And to me, if we, if we create a platform where those things work well together, that will really empower us to deliver what we want to do. And I think that's a really important sort of message within our platform. For the vast majority of stuff, this hasn't really changed for quite a long time. You know, we've still got this idea of orchestration kind of stuff. We might have some business activity monitoring. We need durability, scalability. And if you listen to all the Microsoft presentations this morning, these themes kept coming up over and over again. So if we think, ignore what technology we're going to use, the, the whole sort of idea of a capability still exists. We may have added one or two new ones in places because of these new types of problem. But the, the most common thing is that the changes to these capabilities are more likely to be because we've got a higher level of scale we need to think about. So maybe, you know, maybe that's just some thoughts on capabilities there. But, Getting into the, the idea of um, microservices, so at this point I'm really talking about some of the principles that are important to our platform, and you know, we've, we've got a whole bunch of these principles, and in 45 minutes I can't go through all of them, so I'm really just pulling out the ones that I think are the most important, most interesting to talk about. And because we've talked so much over the last months in the integration space about microservices, um, but I've got a slightly different view on this, so, so if you read the online stuff for microservices, it really talks about building an application as a microservice, which is great, and I, I really like those ideas. But I think there's a couple of gaps in this idea of, of how microservice applications work. And from an integration perspective, my view is, well, that's great, but I'm an integration guy. How does my microservices application communicate and work alongside my monolith? Because they're still going to exist. But also, my microservices themselves, when they start working with each other, how do I make sure that just doesn't become my feature integration spaghetti? You know, that, that's a big challenge. And, and in my opinion, you know, people feel free to, to you know, um, tell me if you disagree, but I think the answer to that is more than just use HTTP or use AMQP. 
that's the that's just the protocol but it's a it's a bigger thing we all know that because we're integration guys now what i want to do though is um although i think there's some challenges there i think there's a lot of really good stuff in microservices that we can use as integration architects and i think although in, in integrate we were talking about the idea of well maybe maybe azure has a microservice type offering as a product what i'm what i'm really saying here is microservices um, sorry, integration using a microservices-based approach, which I think is a different thing. And to me, what I want to be able to do is, in the right places in my architecture, is develop components which have small code bases, they've got very specific jobs, they are deployable in isolation, they can work together, and they use a lot of these, these real principles that are caught to the microservices architecture. And I think when we do that in integration, we'll see a lot of benefits that will change the way you know, the, the way application teams and customers start to view integration, and they'll stop seeing us as a blocker and see us as an enabler. And I think um, my view of what I've seen of app service so far is I think that fits really well with that, which is one of the things that excites me. So um, I'm sure a few of you have, have seen the, the idea represented by this diagram, is that in most companies, a lot of the time you see this idea that teams think integration are really the guys that get in the way. And I like this picture where you know, a lot of the time people view us as having this massive integration product that becomes really difficult to maneuver. And the integration team's a bit like the tugboat crew trying to steer this huge ship through a little channel. And it, you know, it represents all the pain that we quite often see. But by using a microservices approach, um, I kind of thought it maybe it's a bit more like an aircraft carrier potentially then, where we've still got this big reliable, you know, heavy duty thing where we need it. And that's the key point where we need it. But we've also got a few jet fighters on there as well, so we can, we can respond to, to these quick fire requirements in a different way. We don't have to steer the whole ship, we can just launch a fighter plane to go and sort it out. And then if you take that to the next level, well, we make our microservices work together and perhaps we can do some really cool stuff at that point. And as integration guys, my, my thought would be, well, do you want to be a tugboat crew or an, a fighter pilot? And I know which one I'd want to be. So that's a few of the principles, a few of the concepts. Hopefully that, that seems quite interesting to you guys. But if we think about the logical level, so what I want to do is kind of build up a platform that starts making sense and then overlay some technologies on that. So if you imagine we've got this big box, which is our conceptual platform, we've got some applications at the top which are going to be consumers of things provided by the platform. And at the bottom, we've got applications that are going to be um, providing some kind of service or data. So in the platform, we've got the idea of an application connector service, which has a simple job of connecting to an app. Now, it's funny how that sounds a bit similar to API apps, which, you know, they could be one of the things we might use. But if you think of this as really a logical idea of this component that connects to an app, we might have some components that have the job of implementing a business <coughs> service. But if you notice how they're separated from the, app, the application connector, which is kind of a key point here. We've then got what I've described at the university as being our infrastructure, uh, integration infrastructure. So we've got this idea of some EAI component, some ESB component, and some service virtualization, plus some utility stuff and all the, the common things that we, we know you need in a big integration platform. On top of that, we might have some service gateway type components, and these are really for making it easier for a consumer application to come into our platform. So maybe they, maybe they could be represented by an on-ramp, off-ramp pattern. Maybe they could be something like an API gateway, which is like REST or WCF based. And then on top of that, we've got this API, sort of API proxy, which is really about creating communities and supercharging our APIs with, with extra features. So really they're logical, logical types of component within our, within our architecture. And then we've got this idea of a service container. So if we've got a logical container, uh, sorry, a logical component, it could live in a service container somewhere. And we've got different types of containers we could use. So maybe one of them could be you know, on-premise in an IIS virtual directory, perhaps a Windows service or a BizTalk application. They could be a container for, for some of our stuff. On the PaaS platform in Azure, we've got websites, web roles, worker roles, and web jobs. And then I've said feature, maybe it's now, maybe it's feature, but we've, we've got these new containers of logic apps, web apps, API apps, and probably somewhere down the line, Docker as well. 
So we've got some, some choices there about different places we can deploy different types of component to. And the key thing is that a lot of these containers will have different kinds of features. So if we want something like a container of a BizTalk application, well, we get all the, the throttling, the, you know, the pub sub type stuff in message box and all the big fancy features BizTalk has. But we've also got the, the choice of a lightweight container where we don't need all that. Next, we think of the, the physical platform. So let's overlay some technologies now. And what I described at the university was this idea of a core platform. So this is the bit where the technologies in this group will solve most of my integration problems. So these are probably really safe investments for most of the requirements that we'll need. So we probably would have BizTalk server, service bus queue, service bus relays, um, WCF Web API, maybe SSIS if, we, if we're doing some ETL stuff now. If you think of most of the organizations that you guys have worked with, you've probably got some or most of those technologies in place now, and they're, they're pretty safe for, for the, current, uh, the current landscape. But when you think of that diagram, you know, all those slides ago, we had this much bigger set of technologies. So what I wanted to do is explain those as extensions to the core platform. So depending on what type of integration solutions you build, you may bring other technologies in from that toolkit. So if we're doing SOA stuff, API stuff, we might pull in API management, we might get sent in it from the partner ecosystem. If we're doing um, hybrid, we might put VPN, express route, et cetera, et cetera. Industry vertical, so we know we've got some great stuff in the accelerator space, maybe HL7. We may choose to use the EDI stuff on Azure, possibly. Um, SaaS integration, we've got some widgets there, line of business stuff, so we talked earlier about some of the IBM stuff, if you've got host integration type stuff. Mobile extensions, Internet of Things, event, and so we've got Event Hub, Stream Analytics here. So hopefully you can start seeing that, although that big platform's there, you're really putting different things for different types of integration requirements. And then if I think um, the core platform of the future, so we've got our platform now, Quite soon, we'll probably start thinking about where Logic Apps really fits for us. And I think, to me, the, the, ex, you know, the, the sheer extensive features on Logic, uh, on App Service, sorry, means that API App and Logic App fit as really good components in our core platform. But one of the key things is that, you know, I haven't really talked about two-speed IT yet. And I think that's a really important position and piece for App Service, where maybe the, the heavy-duty, robust, reliable stuff that BizTalk offers has a really important place, but there'll be other use cases where that speed and you know, quick-to-market offering from, uh, from app service would really help as well. And that's something that, you know, for the university, they're probably not used to doing that, but in the future, we'll need to do it to maintain this rapid pace of change and you know, keeping up with the other universities in our, in our ecosystem. What about BizTalk server then? So where, where does he fit? And you know, to me, I, I like to think of BizTalk Server as being like my integration Swiss Army knife. You know, it's been around for years. I know it very well. It's got loads of tools in there, tools for different jobs. Well, written for structure piece, again, so yeah, to me, the heart of this is where you're at BizTalk plus Service plus, plus sending it if we need the service virtualization. But I think that, um, that relationship between um, BizTalk and your Service Plus, I've always felt it's one of the core things that's really one of the most important product relationships in this platform. Then as we go up the stack, we've got the idea that um, possibly you know, web apps and app service can, can offer us a hosting location for any kind of service gateways we need to build. Um, and we, you know, that, I think my animation's broken. I'm sending the shirt up here in that, that box that's left. So I've got, got to bring what happens when you change it on the day. <laughs> Uh, and then last but not least, we've got something like API management that will stick over the top to give us those, you know, those community-based features and possible monetization features for APIs. So at this point, I was kind of hoping that um, overlaying technologies on logical capabilities really starts making people think about, about that um, really confused problem earlier and starts you know, start making a bit more sense and maybe think about how these ideas relate to your own organisation. That's something that just popped up at the end there, didn't it? Okay, so demo time. Now, what I um, 
what I wanted to do with the demo was, um, I, I use this here, I've got a reference architecture which uses a lot of the stuff that we've talked about so far as, as an architecture idea, but also it has most of the products that I've talked about as well, so it's got a bunch of stuff that I can't show you again time-wise, but it has this talk server, service bus, web API, app service, the whole, the whole shebang in it. Now, what, um, what I always struggle with with integration demos is it's really hard to make them look cool because we all we always used to do a drop a file in a folder, map it, pick it up, and it looks like a flat file. And, you know, we like it, but if you show that in a business, they just go. Um, so what we decided was um, Minecraft University. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you guys know about this already. But it's not just me playing around, there's a bit more to it than that. Um, so hopefully, hopefully you'll buy this idea, but if not, then okay, fair enough, I'm playing around. So the idea here is Oliver talked earlier about um, Vision 2025. So think about 2025. In 2025, we've got no idea what technology is going to look like. We probably don't really know what it's going to look like in three years' time. But if we're building an architecture design for that, we need, from an R&D perspective, we need to really challenge ourselves and do something that makes it hard for our architecture. So my thought with that was, well, something like a game or Minecraft or something really, you know, it makes me think in different ways than what I'm used to thinking, which is really the, the key thing. But also, you know, students in 2025 are 10 years old now, and 10-year-olds play Minecraft. And my, my little boy is nine, so he plays Minecraft and he can help me do this for the bits that I couldn't do. Um, so that, that was kind of our idea, but you know, once we started showing the guys in the university, this idea of being able to model some of our, some of our things in the university in Minecraft was a really interesting sort of idea. And I think that potentially there's opportunities where we can take this a bit further and we've already shown um, some of our business teams and some of the change teams, the ideas that we've put in here. And it really inspires them in a completely different way to what they used to about what integration's about. So I'm hoping that will be the same for you guys. Now, we've got a couple of use cases. So um, some people may have seen my use case about a password protected door before. I'm going to show that again, but, I, but it's been enhanced a little bit. And then I've got a couple of use cases about about um, a student potentially enrolled for a university course. And I think we're probably, probably getting it, uh, you know, just conscious of time, so I'm going to skip over all the blue there because I've read it on the slides. But what we're really going to do is this idea that on premise we've got some systems, line of business apps, active directory. We've got a, a microservices style architecture that I've built using the services framework we have in the university. I've got a service virtualization component in there. But Minecraft's not in the company, it's outside. So I need to think about how I get into these. And to do this, what I did was um, I hosted a, a REST API with Swagger and it's got all of its um, fancy, you know, fancy page uh, documentation. Hosted that in Azure. I stick API management in front of it. And the great thing is I can import the Swagger straight into API management, so build to be a proxy. And I can use services relay to come down on the prem and hook into my, my existing services stack. So that, that's pretty good. <coughs> now, sorry, I'll show you sure guys what animation is that. Um, okay, so, so kind of what it's going to look like is a bit like that. So, curious of data, my business apps were displayed at Minecraft, and hopefully it'll look really cool. So, I'm going to take the challenge that my internet's going really well. Um, so the first thing is the, the password protected door. So the idea, this, this was the first one uh, me and Adrian worked on, which was, uh, he was playing around code and he wanted some help and I discovered that I can plug Minecraft into some, some more fancy stuff. So here's my treasure room and it's got a door that you can't get inside. Um, if you notice the lights turned off inside, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the terminal to get in and I can put a program called Open Door. So I'll supply my username, supply the right one. So if I supply a good username and password, you <coughs> see so it's going to go and check and please and then be up. So, 
There's the door, but if you notice the lights came on as well, so we can go inside and stuff. Now, that's pretty cool, but what about if you don't, if you're in? You know, that, that will authenticate my credentials against that directory. That's pretty secure, you know. <laughs> and, uh, we've got the password, and uh, lockout policies, and all the great stuff. Um, active directory office. But what happens if you're a hacker? You know, we need some camera measures to see you. You know, stop the evidence. So, let's say if I, uh, I run open door now, and I put home season in password in. So sorry, you can't come in. Now, notice the trap door in there. <laughs> <laughs> if, you if you weren't careful, you could have, um, you could have fell down. And I think. <coughs> I don't know why, but there was supposed to be a zombie appears here as well. It was quite a bit of a filter that was done and sold on the side here, so I was going to have to whack it before you had gone. Um, I'll put that down being a focus to why the zombie didn't appear. He didn't, he didn't spawn, so... Okay, so the next thing, um, that, that was a bit of fun. Now, if we have a look at what else we've got over here, so I've got this giant screen. If we have a look what that says on, I don't know how well you guys can read that. So... That's the status of all the systems in the university. Live. Now. <laughs> 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 What's even better than that, right? Unfortunately, you know, it's one of those days where all of the systems are really good, which is a bit of a shame because if everything goes down and I'm in the game, it launches a firework so I can see that with the system. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and that's, kind of, you know, that, that's the whole point is make it a bit of fun so when I show the business you get that kind of reaction and they're like, wow, you know, integrations empower us to do this cool stuff. And it's not just a ball and file drop thing. So the next thing we're going to do, right, that thing. Sorry, Ben? Can't you disable something? Uh, not from here. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be honest, our Office 365 might go down in a minute. So if you see a firework off in the background in the next five minutes, we know, we know something's broken. Okay, so now what we're going to do is um, I'm going to go into the students' room. If you notice, I've got my nice big, you know, 42 inch flat screen connected to my computer. Here. Check out this thing here, it's a printer. <laughs> so if you notice, um, it's got some paper in it as well, which is quite cool. So I want to enroll for a course now. So the first thing I need to do is see what courses I can do. So let's have a look. Um, so I'll have a look for all the courses that start with A. You can see that's a little bit quicker now, so it's obviously just uh, things. So have a look on the screen and see we've got a whole bunch of the crazy courses. Pretty good. So, I don't know, let's do um, App Services here, App Service 101. Actually, what, what I need to show you is um, I'm not just showing them, but I can also I'll print the courses as well. So, we'll have courses with you again. Come on. There was this little white box down there now. So there's nothing to right here. Take that out of the picture. What's quite cool as well is um, AJ wants me to, to write this stuff like you can actually string multiple pages together and you can put them into a binder. So we can actually have a full course prospectus like you can go to a bookshop or something crazy like that. Um, so we, we've um, so we've seen that there's a couple of courses here. I'm just going to show my uh, show my student information. So you can see I'm actually in the system. There we go. So you can see there's me listed as a student now. What I'm going to do next, just before I show the next demo, I'm going to show a quick slide about how this works. <coughs> so I know I've got all the data from the system, but I do have some kind of business process to you know, do something like we would do in the real world. Okay, so enrollment process. So to enroll for a course, you know that that might have a lot more workflow. So we don't want to just Stick with an RPC pattern and wait until that, you know, that really slow um, <coughs> process happens. So what I want to do is, um, here I've got my API, which is set up to make it easy to integrate with Minecraft. I'm going to set up this here and then drop it onto a queue. But what I'm going to do now is, um, I'm going to do stuff on an easier queue. 
in the service bus to make Dan happy. Uh, we need to be putting our message on there with Jason. We, we will not have that. Can I finish this bit? Yeah. <laughs> so um, we need to put the stuff on there with Jason. Um, that means I can use BizTalk to pick that Jason up. So at key point, Jason's not just for rest, you can use it for other stuff in BizTalk as well. And then I'm going to hook that into the line of business apps. And, uh, Quick demo here. So I can go add, add enrollment. So I'll pick course eight, which I know is a course. <coughs> Me, so I add the enrollment and so there's just confirmation, but you're gonna receive an email shortly. So if I, if I go into my BizTalk VM, So, come on. So here's my orchestration. Looks, you know, very much like a typical orchestration. Um, but what I'm going to do is in, in the console here, you can just see there's a bit of a trace that there's been some stuff happening recently. So we can see BizTalk picked it up, it converted it to JSON, uh, JSON to XML, did its orchestration. It went and looked up from all the different systems to get all the enriched data that I need. And then it would drop a message into the SQL Server, which represents my my back-end um, application, so we should see there'll be a record in here. There's, there's my new enrollment of me. Now, I'm gonna do what, hopefully one quick thing before Sarah Vanna yanks me off the stage, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna um, do this really quickly. So what I wanted to do was the idea that Oliver might come along and go, well, Mike, everything works great, but we've got this, this problem where, because we're now really competitive, um, you know, you'll see an email pop up on my laptop soon, but they get confirmation email, and then when we approve the course, we send a letter out by post to say, you've now been accepted. But the problem is that gives an opportunity for other universities to come along and go, well, we'll offer you a course and we'll give you something better. So what we want to do is get rid of that time delay of, of us clicking to approve a student and actually tell them straight away. But, you know, that, that value of that student, I think, you, um, am I allowed to say how much that is? It should be. So it's about 40 grand per student. So every student we don't, we make an offer to and don't get really expensive. So where apps, there's my email coming through from BizTalk, nice and reliable. Um, where the, the real value of app services is, I can go along and go, right, you know, Oliver, it's not going to take you weeks to do this. Let's do two-speed IT, do something quick and easy. And uh, I can spin up a logic app here and I'll, on my triggers, I can have something which watches that SQL database, waits for you to approve something, and then it'll send out via the Twilio, um, Twilio connector, send out a text so we tell the student as soon as we've approved them. So let's have a look at that in action. And um, if I go back here, sorry, I need to quickly check. So he was 23 was his enrollment ID. So, 23, and might take a second to go through, but once that's gone through our API stack, updated the database to approved, then apart from all the tweets on my phone, the Logic app should um, detect the change, ping a text message through to me, and uh, I should, any second, I'll just show you the database quickly as well. There you go. So, congratulations on enrolling for apps, uh, Azure App Service 101. Your enrollment status is approved. <laughs> so that that's our that's our R and D environment. Um, hopefully, that really you know looks quite cool. We've done some really great stuff there. I had a whole thing about challenges and concerns, but we haven't got time. So if anyone's got user groups and wants me to do a deep dive on this, give me a shout. But otherwise, the only thing I wanted to share was that, that is my biggest concern in the future architecture. How do we, and, and that very deliberately is the BizTalk 2004 diagram, but I've changed, because I wanted you guys to take pictures of it and put them on Twitter. In the current architecture, how do we stop that happening, but with API instead of all the other protocols we used to have on it. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for your time. There's, pop, if you've got any questions, pop them on the discussion forum.